Hey everybody, welcome to Altium Academy. I am your host, Zach Peterson. I am also a technical consultant with Altium and today we are going to be looking at a viewer question around via delay. Now, we talked about this in our most recent Q&A video, but I wanted to do a longer video to discuss how you could actually calculate this because this has come up more than once if we look through some of the comments on the Altium YouTube channel. Lemon writes, will Altium ever support the automatic addition of via delay into signal length tuning? The most frustrating thing about tuning length in Altium using propagation delay in picoseconds versus length in millimeters is that Altium treats all vias as having a zero picoseconds delay, meaning designers have to manually calculate and add this property in themselves. You know what, the lemon, you're right. You do have to manually enter it. There are a couple of reasons for this which we've actually discussed on our back drilling video. And for anyone that wants to watch that video, go check out the link in the description. You can see what we're talking about. Now, my goal in this video is to give you everything that you need to be able to calculate this on your own, and then you can include it in All Team Designer, and I'll show you where to do that. Let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so to get started, let's just briefly review the situation that we're looking at. So in this situation where we want to figure out via delay, what we're looking at is here we've got our familiar side view of a printed circuit board and I've got my track on the top layer. It connects to a via pad. We've then got our via barrel coming down and then we've got our pad on the bottom side. This could also be an internal layer and then we've got our track coming out yeah, we'll just say we've got our track coming out this direction like this. So we've got our copper on the top layer, and up on the top layer, we have a signal that is going to be traveling this direction, eventually makes its way through the via, and then out the other end onto the bottom layer. So in this upper portion of the printed circuit board, the signal speed, velocity, V, is the speed of light in vacuum, C sub zero, divided by the square root of the effective dielectric constant. Now this effective dielectric constant for a microstrip, it obeys a very well-known uh, formula. Uh, you can find it in Waddle's textbook. It's often used alongside the IPC 2141 formula for uh, microstrip impedance, which is actually also then mixed with another formula for the effective dielectric constant. So there are a number of different formulas to get this value, but there's a very simple one that actually comes out from Waddle's equations in Waddle's textbook. So I will link to a copy of Waddle's textbook because I believe that anybody doing high-speed design should have a copy of that textbook. So go check that out in the description. Now, this DK effective is determined by the DK of the substrate as well as the DK value in air, which is just very close to one. It's actually one point, you know, zero, zero, I think another zero and then a three, so on and so forth, but it's very close to one. Here, this could be, of course, you know, four to 4.8 if you're dealing with typical FR4 laminates. Um, let's just go with four just for this demo. So now, once the signal gets over to here and then has to travel through this via and through the substrate, there's gonna be a different DK effective that is seen by the signal as it makes its way along the via and ultimately out to the other side. This DK effective, what is it? Well, this DK effective is actually different from this DK effective here where we have air. The reason is that you're traveling through a different geometry. There's a different amount of air present in this via, or this could even be a conductive epoxy, uh, could be a non-conductive epoxy, whatever the case is. There's gonna be a different DK effective here traveling vertically along the via versus horizontally along the top surface. So just so that we don't confuse these two, let's just put a prime here above this DK effective, okay? So this is the DK effective that is seen traveling through this portion of the circuit, traveling vertically through the via. Now, the signal speed along this via is going to be V prime equals, again, C sub zero, speed of light in vacuum, divided by now square root of DK effective prime, so this new DK value. These DK values can be, you know, on the order of 10 when you have a high DK value for the substrate material. Now, this DK effective value 
is not just determined by the decay effective value seen traveling this way or for fields pointing this way along the uh, material, but there's also a z-axis component to this decay value. So there's a decay value that is determined by electric fields pointing vertically through this substrate material. So we have a decay Z and then a DK, what I like to call a transverse, um, basically meaning any direction perpendicular to the Z axis. So these two things combine together in a certain way to give you this new DK effective value for your via. And then this DK effective value for your via gives you the signal speed traveling through this via. Now, what's the via delay, right? Let's say I know this. What is my via delay? Well, here I have a via with a length L. And so my via delay, we'll just call it, uh, we'll just call it T, is going to be this length divided by the velocity V prime. So this you get to choose because, you know, it's how, how far you're routing. And then this you can calculate based on the material characteristics and the dimensions of the via. Okay, so because the task of calculating via delay is all about calculating an effective dielectric constant, that's exactly what we're going to do now. So let's get into the math stuff. So first point to note, there's a equation for differential vias or the vias that you might put on a differential pair um, that you can use to get a DK effective value. And so we looked at this in the context of back drilling previously. So in the, the context of back drilling, essentially what we were doing is we were looking at the transit time that a, a signal requires to reach the bottom of a via stub. And then we were using that length and that time to figure out if we've exceeded a certain frequency to then determine whether or not back drilling is needed to reduce the stub length and then of course increase the lowest uh, resonance frequency. So in this case we're just getting the DK effective value based on uh, the anti-pad size and then the spacing between two vias and then the via diameter and then the width of the anti-pad here as well as the height. You could have oblong anti-pads if you want. This is the equation that you would use and this equation models the two vias as a pair of rods and calculates the inductance and the capacitance between them. So that equation gives you a DK effective value. And then remember here, the DKTR and the DKZ values, those are the transverse DK value. So basically the DK in the plane leading into the via. And then the DKZ direction is the DK value for the electric field pointing into the substrate, so along the via direction. So the DK effective value depends on both of these quantities. And remember, they're not the same. Um, one is about 20% larger than the other, so you can use a little bit of an approximation there to figure out the DK effective value. Now, DK effective is going to be on the order of 10 for a data sheet DK value of about 4 for typical differential pair via arrangements. So just keep that in mind. So we're going to use that value for DK effective or a DK effective value of about 10 later on. Now, what about for a single ended via? Well, for a single ended via, there is actually a model that you can use, but the model is not universally applicable. Okay. So this comes from Howard Johnson, his textbook, uh, high speed digital design, and then the following textbook, high speed signal propagation. So these are the uh, the black magic textbooks. So you can read about it in uh, or you can read about this model in both of these textbooks. But um, essentially the way this works is that the simplest model for a via passing through a PCB is to use a pi model as shown here in the, the top left corner where my mouse is. So you've got a trace coming in and then the pad has some capacitance and then there's some inductance due to the via barrel. And then there's also some resistance here. And so the resistance you can use in a bit more of a detailed version of this model. But the simplest case here is just an LC model um, in this pi filter. And so using this model, you can actually calculate an inductance for this via and a capacitance for this via. If you look at this as a typical LC circuit, it should exhibit some low pass operation when it is in the lumped element regime, meaning that the wavelength of a signal, if we're considering an analog signal for a moment, the wavelength of a signal passing through this via is very long compared to the actual size of the via or L here. Essentially, vias are considered electrically short 
in this model, and we don't really worry about their impedance. Um, so just like a short transmission line, where we don't tend to worry about its impedance, we're making the same assumption here. So this model is only applicable to uh, long rise times for digital signals. So you can estimate uh, on an order of magnitude basis the transition time or the tra travel time for a signal through this via just using this relation over here. So this is an order of magnitude estimation. It is not an exact equation. But using these geometric parameters for the via pad and then the anti-pad and then the via length and then the barrel diameter, you can get an inductance and a capacitance. So uh, just as an example for differential vias, if dK is 4 for your substrate, then uh, dK effective is about 10 for a pair of differential vias, and that's just calculated using the previous equation. Now for uh, a through-hole via and its pair, you can then calculate a delay time of about 16.5 picoseconds. So remember, this applies to both of the vias that are coupled simultaneously, so this gives you your via delay. Okay, 16.5 picoseconds, so remember that. So what about a single-ended through-hole via? Well, if we take the same dK value of 4, then we get a, uh, an inductance and a capacitance that has these values. So 1.326 nanohenries and about 1.403 picofarads. So then if you use this, you get an order of magnitude for the via delay of about 43 picoseconds for a through-hole via and a standard thickness PCB substrate of 1.57 millimeters. So that's a really long transit time because the time required to travel this same distance in vacuum is 5.23 picoseconds. So basically if dK were 1 and we were considering the same signal traveling through a vacuum, then the time required to travel that distance is going to be 5.23 picoseconds. So that means our dK effective value for a single ended through hole via is actually huge, 67.51. That's a big dK effective value. And that reflects the uh, long transit time here for a single-ended via. So previously we had 16.5 picoseconds and we've got a much larger value, almost three times as much, for a single-ended via on the same substrate traveling the same distance. That's a big difference. So now if I'm inside Altium Designer, where do I go to enter in these different values? Well, here we're just back into our uh, length tuning example project, and here I'm just looking at a route on the top layer. We have another route that goes into the internal layer, and if you remember, we just kind of did that to illustrate the length matching capabilities. But where would you go to actually enter in this value? Well, if you click on one of these vias, you'll see here, propagation delay. There's an entry right here in the properties panel. And here we're dealing with, again, 43 picoseconds since this is a single-ended via. Same thing on this guy. We'd have 43 picoseconds since this is a single-ended via. So now when we apply the length matching tool, it's going to account for an extra 86 picoseconds of required length matching. So here, this is not really the best way to do length matching, but essentially what you'd want to do is, you know, put this structure on here, drag it out, set it to the dimensions that you like. Um, I always like to do, you know, something a little bit closer to this instead of that big, long serpentine route. Um, and then this will get you right there within that allotted time window that you've set in the design rules. One thing that's kind of cool about this feature here with the propagation delay and with the search filter is I can actually turn off all of those filters, just select vias. And if I wanted to, I could just hit control A and select every via in the board and then I can set a propagation delay value for every single via if I like. You could also use the query filter or the search query function uh, to select certain vias if you want. That's a bit more of an advanced topic, but you could use a search query to select specific vias like on specific nets and then apply a propagation delay value if you wanted to. So that's how you do this inside Altium Designer. That's how you calculate it. And that's going to get accounted for in length matching. And you can actually tell here if I just, you know, select these, let's say I, you know, up this to 430 picoseconds just for fun. As soon as I change that and then I go over here to my length matching section, you'll notice here I've got a long way to go before this gets back into to complete matching. In fact, I've got to bring it all the way out like this to really get it even close. So that just illustrates that it is accounting for the time delay in these vias once you enter it. 
Okay, that's it everybody. Leave your comments and questions in the comments section. Make sure to hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. Send your questions to YouTube at allteam.com because we love getting your questions and we'll be doing some more Q&A soon. All right, thanks everybody. And definitely don't forget to call your fabricator.